I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to a video conference edition of the New York Times Close Up. The conventions, such as they were, are over. Labor Day has come and gone. The presidential race is now at full throttle. The Democrats held an almost entirely virtual convention. Even many Republicans admitted Joe Biden gave the best speech of his career. Donald Trump broke with norms and staged much of the GOP convention at the White House, following some negative headlines. His own sister, Mary Ann, a former federal judge, on tape saying Trump was a liar with no principles. Steve Bannon, his former chief strategist, arrested on fraud charges involving a build the wall project. That was nothing compared to the firestorm over reports that he called wounded and dead American soldiers suckers and losers. What's the political impact of this story? Well, we'll talk about it in a moment. First, a quick poll check. The latest CBS YouGov poll has Biden with a 10-point lead over Trump. That's a few points more than most. So with less than two months to go before Election Day, let's take the political pulse. We're joined by Trip Gabriel, national political correspondent for The Times, Johanna Barr, a senior politics editor at The Times, and Jonathan Ellis, also a senior politics editor. Trip, you had a story the other day that uh, should alarm most people, regardless of whom they're voting for, and that is the Democrats' doomsday scenario for election night. What is that scenario and how likely is it? Sam, it's a um, scenario which uh, is, is driven by the fact that there's a very large partisan difference between voters who plan to uh, vote absentee or by mail and voters who plan to show up in person this year. And a lot of that's being driven, of course, by uh, President Trump's demonization of uh, mail balloting all year, calling it uh, rife for fraud, um, uh, which is uh, which is baseless, uh, a baseless accusation. Um, if a whole lot of uh, Republican voters show up on election day um, and cast their ballots in, in some crucial uh, swing states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and, and Wisconsin uh, being being the three chief ones, those ballots are are going to be uh, counted and reported uh, on election night. Um, whereas a lot of mail-in ballots, uh, which can arrive up to a week after Election Day um, and are going to be heavily uh, uh, favorable to Joe Biden, might not be counted uh, for days and days and, and maybe a week later. So uh, there will be the appearance of a landslide for Donald Trump uh, when the early returns come in on Election Night. Democratic strategists and elected officials are um, uh, fearful and, and, and maybe even alarmed in some cases that uh, the president will declare a premature victory as he has um, uh, sort of uh, signaled that he will, he will all year. And, and that if these states shift over to Joe Biden, you know, he will uh, amplify his claims that the mail ballots are, are fraudulent and, and just so a lot of distrust in the, in the reporting of, of the results. Jonathan, you and Johanna, Pat Healy, others running the politics desk on election night, how are we at the Times going to report that both in the print paper the next day and on the web? How are we going to deal with an election that may well night, mel, well might not end on election night? Sam, you want us to reveal our secret plans? Yes, uh, no, the, 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 the plans uh, won't be so secret. I, we will certainly try to make it very clear ahead of time exactly how we are, are going to uh, report and display the results. Uh, those discussions are ongoing, um, but I can I can say that you know we're, we're certainly looking at different ways of trying to indicate how many votes are still uh, out there, uh, both uh, sort of from in-person voting and from uh, absentee or mail-in voting. And so, uh, if we can come up with with good ways of of indicating that, that'll that'll give people a better sense of what's going on. I think one thing that we've been uh, tending to um, move away from is sort of the very traditional uh, percentage of precincts reporting number. That uh, uh, precincts reporting number is often misleading because it, it may not really take into account the number of uh, absentee or, or mail-in uh, ballots remaining to be counted. So we're, we are certainly looking at other ways of displaying that data on election night on nytimes.com. 
Why is it uh, that the Democrats are not more worried about Republican uh, manipulation or, frankly, Russian manipulation about the results when we see from federal reports, uh, bipartisan uh, reports in Congress, that the Russians are trying once again to manipulate the elections? Joanna? I mean, I think they, they are worried about that, um, you know, and, and there have been uh, statements and there, are, you know, have been talk of hearings, um, but it, it, it just feels like there, you know, as, as much as we as journalists feel like there's a lot going on, it, it, there's just so much, um, you know, sort of pulling attention. And I, I, I would hope that uh, uh, the early warning signs, which have all, you know, there's, it's been, it's been clear that there's manipulation on Facebook, uh, other platforms. Um, you know, we, we as a news organization are, are trying very hard to, uh, to sound the alarm and to document that for our readers. Um, but I, there's just so, so many things to focus on at the moment, the pandemic, uh, the mail voting issue, you know, I think you're right that that it's sort of gotten lost in the shuffle a bit. Tripp, you've written a lot about uh, Trump's play for the suburbs, uh, his supporters dismissing behavior that others might find disqualifying. How is the issue of race playing there? Uh, people are concerned about crime. They are certain, certainly concerned about uh, riots or looting. Uh, they're concerned uh, to some extent about defunding uh, the police uh, when crime is an issue. Uh, what role is race playing in this campaign and how much can uh, Trump milk it uh, in ways that uh, he perhaps wasn't able to do before? Well, Sam, I think, you know, we, we've clearly seen Donald Trump try to uh, uh, use um, fear mongering, you know, uh, with suburban voters, uh, pretty much uh, white voters and, 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 and claim that, you know, defunding police or um, the, the looting that uh, sometimes is breaking, broken out, you know, over, over uh, at, 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 at protests, you know, will, will destroy the, sub, the suburbs. And, and most uh, recently, he's claimed to have, uh, you know, unraveled a, um, a regulation from the Obama era about affordable housing in the suburbs. Um, according to the polls, th these efforts are not uh, working particularly well uh, for the Trump campaign. Um, polls show that uh, there's one uh, from Pennsylvania uh, quite recently, um, a key state that uh, you know, more people trust uh, Joe Biden to handle uh, racial matters. Um, and the question is asked uh, slightly uh, differently, you know, are you more concerned about looting or are you more concerned about the police violence, you know, against, uh, against African-American uh, men who've, 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 who've been uh, killed or injured, at, you know, at, at the hands of police. Um, you know, looting does, uh, you know, does uh, top that concern among among suburban voters in, in a place like Pennsylvania. Um, but, you know, it is in the end not a, a, a winning issue for, for Trump. I mean, he's doing very poorly in suburb in suburbs, uh, particularly in the northern battleground states, a little different in the in the south, where the suburban voter you know has a, has a different ideological orientation and is, is more evangelical uh, white voter than than in the north. But um, so far, that is uh, you know Democrats are are fearful or fretful that uh, or, or were that Trump would uh, you know would make gains with this law and order message. Um, it doesn't appear to be uh, to be having an impact so far. Jonathan, uh, we've seen a lot of appeal, uh, as Tripp says, by Trump to that base of support, the people who think uh, he can do no wrong. Uh, is he widening that base at all? Are there others who are joining it, or is he still uh, solid only with that base and not expanding it? There's, there's not a lot of indication that he's, he's widening his, his base of support. Uh, you know, as, as Tripp was saying, a lot of this election will be fought at the margins in the suburbs, in uh, certain battleground states. Uh, and if his, if his message uh, of, of sort of his law and order message uh, is not breaking through there, uh, it's not really going to help him widen that base of support. You know, another problem is that he's, he's uh, not been able to really stay focused on that message. Uh, you know, it, perhaps it would be more effective for him uh, if, you know, he was really able to uh, laser focus on driving that message home. But of course, there are always other distractions that come up. You mentioned some of those at the top of the show. And of course, uh, the president sort of brings in uh, his own distractions himself. This week, he was, you know, talking again about impeachment and, uh, you know, his claims that the 
uh, he was spy, you know, his 2016 campaign was spied on, you know, those kinds of things that sort of rehash these old fights that, that don't seem to really do anything to expand, you know, the, you know, if people haven't bought into to those kinds of messages already, you know, it's not really going to expand his, his base of support uh, by bringing back those greatest hits. And Johanna, when he talks about uh, fallen soldiers, fallen American soldiers being suckers and losers, how does that affect his base? Um, you know, there are, I mean, these are reports, of course, we don't know for sure that he said these things, although they do sound very similar to other things that he is documented as having said. Um, you know, there, there, military voters and voters linked to the military, like traditionally skew Republican. Um, this should be, uh, you know, a base of voters who he could rely on. And yet, you know, Joe Biden among Democrats is one is, is one of the more appealing Democrats to voters who are linked to the military. And, you know, there are also Republican voters who this is just going to, uh, you know, further offend their sense of decency in the way that you speak about people who, uh, have sacrificed everything for the country that we all live in. You know, um, it's it, it, it is not the sort of story that they wanted to break in the final two months of the election. Uh, it took up you know the entire news cycle on Friday and into the weekend last week, and it's continued this week. And you know, it's it's it has a, the potential to be very damaging. Of course, so uh, we don't know what's going to happen between now and election day with epidemics and who knows what else. But one of the things that Tom Friedman raised in his column the other day was kind of interesting. He said the success of Joe Biden's campaign against Trump may ride on his ability to speak to the sense of humiliation, the quest for dignity of many Trump supporters, which he said Hillary Clinton failed to do. Uh, Trip is Joe Biden doing that at all? Is that resonating at all with the message that uh, Joe Biden is sending to not only uh, his Democratic base, but beyond that? Uh, Jonathan, what do you say? I'm sorry, I think we lost trip for a moment. Sure, I mean, you know, just to, to echo Johanna's point, I mean, if you're gonna make the argument that, that you need to speak to those kinds of concerns, you know, it may be that Democrats really did choose one of their best messengers in Joe Biden, who has sort of had this very long track record of uh, connecting and empathizing with blue collar workers and sort of, you know, describing himself as, as uh, blue collar Joe and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, we will continue to see as we get closer and closer to election day in the polling, uh, whether whether Biden is able to to uh, you know win over more of those voters, there's there's certainly uh, some suggestion in in some polling uh, that he's made uh, some some inroads, uh, particularly with with women without uh, college degrees who may um, you know be sort of uh, leaning over toward his side. Uh, so so yeah, I mean you know. He's obviously not going to win over all of those voters. President Trump still has a very deep connection with his base. Uh, but if there if there was a, a, a Democrat who who would have been able to to again sort of chip away at the margins there, you know maybe Joe Biden was one of the best uh, choices for the party. And Joanna, what about the debates? Uh, how important are they likely to be? And do we have any sense of of how to handicap those in advance? Um, I think they'll be important. Um, I think, uh, you know, the well, the interesting thing is with early voting, I mean, some people will have voted um, even before any debate airs. So that's something that we need to consider. Um, although, you know, there probably are not that many persuadable voters who are just going to be totally swung by one by just seeing one debate. I mean, we, we sort of know who these people are at this point. Um, but, you know, we'll have to see what happens. Um, Joe, Trump has, has done Biden a favor by setting very low expectations for his ability to string together sentences in public, quite frankly, um, which is why, you know, when he gave a, a very uh, solid speech at the convention, um, it, was, it was viewed as a, such a success for his campaign. So, you know, when Biden is, if Biden gives a competent performance and um, looks at like the solid uh, sort of more steady choice next to an unpredictable Trump on the debate stage, that could be a positive um, 
you know, image for him. Um, but we remember what happened in 2016. Uh, Trump, you know, used that debate stage, particularly the one where he was leering behind Hillary Clinton to great effect. Um, you know, the gender dynamics here are obviously different and uh, he won't necessarily have the same opportunity, especially if he's adhering to social distancing, but we'll see what he pulls out of his pocket. And of you course, know, you never know. And we're looking forward to that vice presidential debate as well. Thanks to Trip Gabriel, to Johanna Barr, to Jonathan Ellis of the New York Times. Coming up next, the showdown over opening New York City schools coming up. School districts all over the country are still struggling with the question of when and how to open schools safely during a pandemic. Many of the biggest, like Los Angeles and Chicago, are going entirely virtual. New York City, the largest school district in the country with over 1.1 million students, over 1,800 schools, the city seems for now to have the pandemic pretty much under control. But that didn't make opening the schools for in-person learning any easier. It led to a showdown between the mayor and the teachers union and a compromise. The school year was delayed by 10 days to reassure teachers and parents that every safety measure was being taken. So where do we stand? We're joined by Michael Mulgrew, the president of the UFT, the teachers union of York City, and Dana Rubenstein, a Metro reporter for the New York Times. Michael, a school is not opening when it was supposed to. It is opening 10 days late because the city finally agreed to a number of union demands about safety. What were those demands and did the union get everything it wanted? Thank you, Sam, for having me. Um, yeah, the union was working with a group of uh, medical doctors there's tops in their field, you know, a head epidemiologist at Harvard Medical School, and we were working with the head uh, epidemiologist here at Northwell, and as, uh, as well as their infectious disease doctors, and a group of engineers in, um, in terms of building ventilation. And there was real concern that the mayor was making a move to just open the schools to say that he could, and the more we set with especially the medical doctors, their fear was that if we opened the school without a medical monitoring program in place, that there was a real um, fear, but uh, uh, there was a real fact that we might, the schools might become the center for um, moving, bringing the virus back into our city at a, at a dangerous level. So really the showdown was about how do we make sure that our schools are doing everything there that they should be doing based off of independent experts? Not, you know, the city doctors are nice people, but they work for the city. Uh, we need an independent medical uh, affirmation about what needed to be done for our school system. And then it was clear to us um, that there was no way the school system could open uh, uh, for students on September 10th because there was no way it would have been ready. Dana, why was the mayor so intent on opening the schools for in-person learning? Was this a macho thing on the mayor's part to show that he could do it when other cities couldn't? Or was it uh, an economic development thing saying that uh, for business to get going again, uh, the city had to send kids to school so that parents could go back to work? Well, if you speak to him, or his people, they will admit to neither of those things. Um, but they will say that, you know, the that in person learning is extremely important to the emotional and intellectual and academic development of children. And it, it is sort of uh, more, you know, it, it provides a greater advantage or more disadvantageous to children who are, you know, of limited means. And so continuing to have remote education just sort of aggravates the pre-existing divides between kids who come from wealthy families and kids who don't. And moreover that parents, working parents, sorry about that. That's okay. That shows how human we are. Go ahead. <laughs> that working parents need a place to put their children. You know that many of them don't have the advantage of being able to work from home. Mm -hmm. So that was his rationale. And I mean, he also often pointed out that New York City is in its infection rate more akin to 
you know, Western European cities than it is to cities in the rest of the country. Mike, uh, would you send your kids to public school at this point? Uh, we're going to have 10% of the student body tested once a month. That means 90% of them won't be tested in effect. Uh, and also one in five teachers, uh, because they may have special vulnerabilities to disease, will be permitted to work from home, which means, you know, some number of kids won't be getting in-person learning, which most people agree is better. So, you know, how good is this compromise? It may be the best you could have gotten, but how good is it? Well, it's not really, it's not so much a compromise. It's really about fighting for what you believe you have to do in this, in a situation nobody's ever been in before. Mm -hmm. So we, and then, in, you know, even though we we came to that agreement, we just spent the entire last week uh, basically doing press conferences at different times throughout the city. Uh, you know, on Monday, we had to come to an agreement not to open up our set of schools. Uh, you know, and that was the first day. And, and it's like, we're not going to compromise on the safety. Uh, and then we had a series of events about uh, personal protective equipment not getting to certain sites. And we had teachers at different points of this week walk out of their buildings. Everything was, uh, you know, they were speaking to us, we were speaking to them. Uh, and, and, and then it was really to keep pushing the city so that come September 21st, I want every parent, including if I was had a school age child, to understand that their school is safe and that we've done everything properly. Uh, but we're not there yet. I mean, it's going to be this this week was quite long, to say the least. And next week is going to be just as long. Uh, but I think it's in our, you know, we're going to keep pushing it, everyone, uh, until we can guarantee to parents that all schools are being treated the same in terms of what has to be done in order to ensure their child's safety. All schools being treated the same. Mike, did we learn anything from this experience that all schools have to be treated in effect independently on their own because they're not all the same uh well, that each school has its own problems well first it's all schools have to be treated the same that every school has to have the right uh personal protective equipment right. every school has to have the right procedures that mm -hmm. was not happening that was abundantly clear just this past week with what we've gone through as a city because we saw right away on the the first day the teachers were to report that our most vulnerable school district, uh, District 75, was clearly not getting the support they were supposed to be given. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of that first, but then once we get everything in, in place that all schools have the same support and they have the same plans to keep children safe, it then becomes about then we have to monitor each community and that's where we might treat schools differently because if we do have any sort of an uptick, of positive test cases in a community, then we need to flood the school itself with testing. And if we get uh, if we get two test uh, positive tests in the school, then bring it into a remote setting. Dana, there was always a lot of faith uh, from computer experts and others in remote learning. Uh, why is remote learning not working, or didn't it work as effectively as people thought it might? And uh, you know, there's still going to be a fair amount of remote learning in the public schools and also uh, obviously in the private schools where people are still paying a good deal in tuition. Okay, well, I think it's, I mean, I have a three and a half year old. I, I know that's not quite the same as school age, but it's very difficult for a lot of students to engage in learning remotely. I mean, a lot of kids need to be in a, in a school setting, in a space with other students and a teacher in front of them. Uh, and Michael, go I'm ahead. Chime in on that. I, I, I mean, I think everyone just uh, believed because colleges did online classes, mm -hmm. that, that's what schools were. You know, it doesn't work that way. Uh, depending on the age of the student, there's different uh, abilities. But more importantly, when you're doing pre-K through 12 education, first and foremost, it's about engagement with the student and a personal relationship. You're not going to get that over looking at a screen for a period of time per day. And then there were the groups of, uh, uh, let's just say, bureaucrats and elected officials who thought you just put a camera in the middle of the classroom that teacher would teach normally. None of that's effective. And it, we proved that throughout March and June that you can, we've tried those things. They're completely ineffective. This is about how do you engage a student. And also, you have to be careful about what times you're engaging them and how, for how much time you're engaging them. Dana's child, we don't want to put that child in front of a computer screen for five hours, period. Doesn't work. 
how much in-person learning will the average New York City public school student get in this semester, say? For the breakdown we have right now with the number of students who have opted out uh, or are not going into blended learning, fully remote students, it's, I can give you the school system, it's over 70% of all instruction will be done remotely, mm -hmm. which is why the amount of effort we put into doing the live in person is very important, but we have to, we've, we're putting in even more of an effort on the remote side to take what we've learned and try to make it better. But there, you know, there it's, it's a constant struggle with the Department of Education on how to figure those things out for the whole school system because their response generally is always let a school figure it out. Mm -hmm. And this is not the time we just let schools figure things out on their own. Well, we'll invite you back for a progress report. Thanks to Mike Mulgrew, the United Federation of Teachers, to Dana Rubenstein of the New York Times. And for the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.